Hello and welcome to another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 4, Lesson 11 on inscribing regular polygons and circles. This is our final lesson on Unit 4 that's been all about constructions, right? And this will be kind of like a sort of a different lesson in terms of constructions. So let's get right into it and talk about what it means for something to be a regular polygon and take a look at the three very specific types of regular polygons that we can inscribe in a circle. All right, here we go, inscribing figures and circles. In our last set of constructions for now, we will learn how to inscribe a square, an equilateral triangle and a regular hexagon in a circle. We begin with the square. Now before we even get into the square, just to make sure what you, what, that you understand what it means to inscribe a figure in something else, right? To inscribe a figure in a circle basically means that all of its vertices will be touching the circle. So somehow we are going to be able to, with just starting with a circle that has its center marked, we will somehow be able to put a perfect square in this circle so that its four vertices touch the circle. All right, let's see how to do that in exercise number one. Given circle O shown below, do the following. Letter A, draw a diameter through O in any direction, label its endpoints as A, and label its endpoints as point, points A and B. <laughs> All right, so, and this is true. We can draw a diameter any way we want, right? We just have to make sure it goes through the center of the circle, otherwise it's not a diameter. Now, it's probably, you know, you're probably gonna feel most comfortable with drawing one that is horizontal. So I'm just gonna do that, and I'm going to label its endpoints A and B. And that's mainly so we can talk about it later. There's no requirement to do this if you're inscribing a circle or inscribing a square in a circle, but I wanna do that so that we can then talk about later on why we know it's a square, etc. All right, let me just move my compass out of the way. Let's take a look at letter B. Construct the perpendicular bisector of AB. Label its intersections with the circle as points C and D. All right, well we have done perpendicular bisectors so many times in this unit, I want you to pause the video right now and draw the perpendicular, or construct the perpendicular bisector to segment AB. Go ahead and do that. All right, well you know how to construct the perpendicular bisector, but let's go through it again, right? What we're going to do is we're going to take our compass, we're going to put the pointy end on one end of our segment. We're going to stretch it out so that it is more than half the length of the segment. That's pretty easy in this case. We're going to draw an arc here, rotate our compass down below the line, draw an arc here, rotate our compass back up, switch the compass so that the point of our compass now is at the other end of our line segment. Again, rotate our compass up, draw an arc, Rotate our compass down, draw an arc. X's mark the spot. Let me move my compass now out of the way. And I can now connect the two X's to form the perpendicular bisector. Let me make my ruler a little bit longer. Love the fact that I have a ruler that I can make longer and shorter. Wow, that is uh, not the greatest line, um, but Apparently I, I didn't have the greatest ruler luck there. Um, let me mark this C, ooh my, and D. Sometimes that digital ruler gives me a nice straight line and sometimes it doesn't. This is one of those it doesn't case. Okay, let's bring our circle up a bit and let's take a look at letter C. <laughs> Draw segment AC, segment BC, segment AD, and segment BD Quadrilateral ACBD is a square. All right, so I claim if you draw in those four segments, you're gonna have a square. Why don't you pause the video right now and go ahead and draw them in. All right, let's go ahead and do this quickly. Hopefully my ruler is gonna work this time, although I don't have a lot of faith that, given that it didn't work last time. Um, there we go, let's draw this in. Oh, of course. Nice sharp straight line now. And the 
let's bring it over to C and connect C and B. A little bit better. And finally, draw in segment BD. Now, of course, you're probably used to squares being oriented so that their sides are sort of horizontal and vertical, but that looks a lot like a square, right? Definitely looks like a square. So that's pretty easy, right? To inscribe a square in a circle, we draw an initial diameter, okay? That establishes two of the vertices of the square. We then draw the perpendicular bisector of the segment that we just drew. That establishes the other two vertices of the square, and then we connect the four vertices and we've got our square, all right? It's really as simple as that. Now, we really should justify, even though it looks like a square, we should justify that it is a square. Now, before we do that in exercise two, remember really what a square is. A square is a four-sided figure, figure known as a quadrilateral that has all four sides being the same length and all four angles being the same size, that's what makes it a regular polygon, and all four of those angles have to be 90 degrees. So what we wanna do right now is we wanna justify why all four of those sides have to be the same length and why all four of the vertex angles have to be right angles. All right, so let's take a look at that. In exercise number two, I'm going to get rid of my compass now. It's done its job for now. Let's take a look at exercise two. Answer the following questions based on the construction above, which I've now got pictured there down below. Letter A, what triangle congruence theorem could be used to prove that triangle AOC is congruent to triangle AOD is congruent to triangle BOC is congruent to triangle BOD? Explain your choice. Mark appropriate knowns on the diagram based on the construction. All right, so in other words, I want to prove that this particular triangle, right, AOC is congruent to triangle AOD is congruent to triangle BOD and BOC. What I'd like you to do is take a moment and mark down everything that you know in this picture based on the construction and of course based on the fact that we're in a circle whose center is O. Pause the video now and see if you can use then that information to figure out what you could use, which triangle congruence theorem, side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, 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 side, hypotenuse, leg, which one of those you could use to prove that those four triangles are congruent. Pause the video now and play around a little bit with this. All right, well, what do we know for certain? Here's a few things we know. Right, we know that O is the center of this circle, right? But that means that OA, OC, OB, and OD are all radii of the circle, and all radii of a circle are the same length. So I can say for certain that this, 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 and this are all the same length. All right, no question about it, and we'll get all this down in a little bit. Now, the other thing I know is that DC, or CD, is the perpendicular bisector of AB. Now, the fact that it's a bisector doesn't matter that that much because I already know that AO and BO are the same length based on the fact that those are radii. But the fact that it's perpendicular tells me that this angle is 90 degrees, this angle is 90 degrees, this angle is 90 degrees, and this angle is 90 degrees. Okay? So what theorems, what theorem could I use now to say, let's just look at two of these, that AOC is congruent to BOC? Well, I can use the side angle side theorem, right? A side congruent to a side, an angle congruent to an angle, and a side congruent to itself, right? Side angle side. And I can do that with all four of them, right? Side angle side. Why? Well, because AO is congruent to CO is congruent to BO is congruent to DO. I'll just put a parentheses all radii, right? And angle AOC is congruent to angle BOC is congruent to angle AOD is congruent to angle BOD. Um, all 
right angles, right? So side angle side, no matter what, based on our construction and the fact that this is a circle, those three triangles, those three right triangles, all have to be congruent based on side angle side. Now remember though, what we're trying to prove is the fact that all four sides of this quadrilateral are the same length and all of its vertex angles are 90 degrees. So let's take a look at B. Because these triangles are congruent, what can you conclude about sides AC, BC, BD, and AD mark on the diagram? All right, we'll pause the video now and see if you can answer letter B. Well, these four right triangles are congruent, which means corresponding parts of those right triangles also have to be congruent, which means AOC must be, con I'm sorry, AC must be congruent to BC, must be congruent to BD, must be congruent to AD, so they are all congruent, and that is based on CPCTC, right? Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Now that's almost enough to show that this is a square, right? We now definitely have a four-sided figure where all four sides are the same length. Now technically what that's called is a rhombus, and we're going to be getting into quadrilaterals all over the place in a couple units from now. So we don't quite know that it's a square yet. We simply know that it's a quadrilateral that has four congruent sides. But now, let's get into why all four of its angles also have to be 90 degree angles. And here we're going to do a little bit of numerical work. Let's take a look at letter C. Because triangle AOC, triangle AOD, triangle BOC, and triangle BOD are all isosceles right triangles, what must be the measure of each of their acute angles mark on the diagram? All right, so again, what I'd like to know like, let's just kind of hone in, and I'm going to go into a different color right now. Let's just hone in on these two angles, right? What do their measures have to be? Pause the video now and see if you can figure that out. Well, we've worked extensively with isosceles triangles, right? These just happen to be isosceles right triangles. And these two angles have to be congruent because they're opposite of these two congruent sides. Now, we know that every triangle has 180 degrees, or at least the three angles sum to 180 degrees. If we subtract out the 90 degree angle here, we're left with 90 degrees left over that have to be divided evenly amongst these two. So each of those have to be right, 90 degrees divided by 2, they have to be 45 degrees. That's got to be 45 degrees, that's got to be 45 degrees, and of course it's not just those two. This has to be 45 degrees, this has to be 45, this has to be 45, that has to be 45, 45, and 45. All those have to be 45 degree angles. And you can probably tell what the end of the story is now going to be. Let's take a look at letter D. Why can we now conclude that angle ACB, angle CBD, angle BDA, and angle DAC are all right angles? Mark on the diagram, right? So why can I now conclude that? It's simple. Each one of these angles, right, is simply a combination of two 45 degree angles. So angle AOC, right, um, I'm sorry, not angle AOC, angle ACB, ACB, which is this one, right, has to be a 90 degree angle because it's a 45 plus a 45, right? That has to be a 45 plus 45, that has to be 45 plus 45, and that has to be 45 plus 45. So each are just the sum of two adjacent 45 degree angles. And there it is, right? That tells us it must be a square. We've got a four-sided figure with four congruent sides and four 90 degree angles. All right. That also gets us and leads us nicely into our next topic, which is more broadly, what is a regular polygon? 
So let's move on and take a look at our next few things. I'm gonna go back to blue real quick as my preferred color. Regular hexagons and equilateral triangles. Inscribing regular hexagons and equilateral triangles in a circle is relatively easy. First, we have to explore the connection between the two. All right, so let's take a look at exercise number three. Regular hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F <laughs> is shown below. Answer the following questions. Letter A. What does it mean for a polygon to be a regular polygon? Hmm. What does it mean for something to be a regular polygon? Well, we've talked about this a little bit before, back when we looked at symmetry of polygons back in Unit 2. Pause the video now and see if you can write down what it means for a polygon to be a regular polygon. Well, it's pretty simple. For something to be a regular polygon, all of its sides have to be congruent and all of its angles have to be congruent. That's it. So, all sides, well, that was weird. All sides must be congruent and all angles must be congruent. Okay, great. No problem. Now, letter B. Draw in segment AC, segment CE, and segment AE. Awesome. This is simple enough to do. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video and draw in those three segments. All right, doesn't look like I gave myself a ruler. No, I didn't. So I'm just gonna hand sketch these in. All right, let me put in AC. Let me put in CE. Boy, that's why I should use a ruler, or at least bring this up a little bit better. All right, let me do CE and AE. All right, you probably can already see where I'm going on this, but let's take a look at letter C. What triangle congruence theorem could be used to prove that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle CDE is congruent to triangle EFA? Justify. All right, well keep in mind, right, ABCDEF is a regular hexagon. So pause the video now, mark some things up, and see if you can figure out simply what triangle theorem could be used to prove that this triangle, ABC, is congruent to this triangle, CDE, and is congruent to this triangle, EFA. Pause the video now. Well, it seems like our favorite because it's gonna be side, angle, side again, and here's why. Because this is a regular hexagon, we know that all of these six sides are the same length. But, because it's a regular hexagon, we also know that this angle must be congruent to that angle, must be congruent to that angle. Right, and there you see it, right? A side congruent to a side, an angle congruent to an angle, and a side congruent to a side. Yes, I know that, you know, we've got like all of these sides congruent to each other, but it's definitely side, angle, side. Very similar to our last proof with the square. So I can say side, angle, side, and that's simply because all sides are congruent and all angles are congruent in hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F. All right, great. So finally, Right? Why can we now say that triangle ACE, ACE, is an equilateral triangle? Pause the video now and see if you can answer that. Well, also very similar to our square, right? Because we know that those three triangles are congruent, we can now say that these three sides are congruent by CPCTC, and that's now an equilateral triangle because it has three congruent sides. All right, so based on CPCTC, right, 
AC must be congruent to CE, this must be congruent to EA, so triangle ACE is equilateral. Right? You might be thinking to yourself, well, of course it's equilateral. It looks like it's equilateral, right? It's got to be equilateral. But the point in geometry is that we justify, we prove, we use previous results to understand why something must be the way it is. Now, let's figure out how we can inscribe both a regular hexagon and then an equilateral triangle into a circle. And it's really rather easy. Let's take a look. Inscribing regular hexagons and then equilateral triangles. Let's take a look at exercise number four. Given circle O below, do the following. Letter A, draw a diameter in any direction. All right, great. And yet again, I don't seem to have my ruler. I don't know why. I'm going to actually bail out really quick and grab a ruler because I want one for this. All right, there's my ruler. Awesome. Let's go back into my full screen view. So we've now got to draw a diameter in any direction. So this starts off very, very similar to our square construction. So that's simple enough. We'll just bring our ruler down and I'll just draw a nice horizontal diameter again. Okay, move that out of the way. And now let's take a look at the rest of the construction. Letter B. Using each end point of the diameter as a center, Draw an arc whose radius is the same radius as that of circle O. Each arc that you draw should intersect the circle twice. Mark these intersection points. Okay, so in other words, I want to take my compass and I'm going to put the pointed end of the compass on one end of that diameter and I'm going to stretch my compass out so that it has a radius that is the same as the radius of circle O. I'm now going to draw an arc so that it intersects the circle twice. And then I'm going to do that exactly the same way with putting the pointed end of the compass down on the other end of my diameter. And I'm going to draw another arc so that it intersects the circle twice. I'm going to close that up. And I'm just going to mark these intersection points just with some dots. I think I'm going to also mark the uh, endpoints of the diameter with points just so that I can really see it. Okay, let me move this out of the way so we can be able to read. Let's take a look at letter C. Connect the endpoints of the diameter and the four intersection points from B with non intersecting line segments. Label this figure A, B, C, D, E, F. It will be a regular hexagon. Excellent. In other words, if I now take my ruler, maybe make it a little bit smaller, and I bring it over here, and I connect each one of these things to each other, right, just like that, and you can probably just do it right along with me as we go, right, if I connect all of these, then what I'm going to end up having is a regular hexagon. Now, unlike the square, we're not going to justify this right now. You're going to spend some time on the homework justifying why this must be a regular hexagon, but it probably doesn't take too much to convince you that it is, given that it looks quite a bit like a regular hexagon. But we still want you to justify it. You'll just do that on the homework. And there we have it. A beautiful regular hexagon. A six-sided figure where all the sides are the same length and all the angles are the same angle. Now we have one final consideration, which is how do we get that equilateral triangle? All right, so letter D. Using what we learned in exercise number three, construct an equilateral triangle. State the name of your equilateral triangle below. There are two different ones. All right, so again, in case you've forgotten, right, if I go back just a little bit, right, to my previous exercise, we saw that if we connected every other vertex of a regular hexagon with a straight line segment, then what we ended up getting was an equilateral triangle. So really the key to, a to constructing an equilateral triangle is having a regular hexagon sitting there. 
So now that we've got this thing, why don't you go ahead and draw in an equilateral triangle? Pause the video now. Now you might wonder, why do I have these both here? Well, it's because you could have two different equilateral triangles, all depending on which three vertices you choose to use. So for example, right? If I connect A to C to E, I get isosceles, uh, sorry, equilateral triangle ACE. On the other hand, I could choose the other three vertices, right? And if I connect B, D, and F, I get equilateral triangle BDF. And it really doesn't matter which. Now, technically speaking, right, you can already see this, I think, you don't really have to draw the whole hexagon, right? In fact, what you really just have to have is that diameter again, Okay, and then you have to have simply one of the two arcs, right? Because if I just had drawn this arc, then I could just connect that point, that point, and this end point of the diameter, and I'd have my equilateral triangle. I personally kind of like having the regular hexagon there because it sort of shows me the connection between the regular hexagon and the equilateral triangle. All right, let's summarize. Now you may have noticed, right, that we only inscribed three regular types of polygons in circles, right? We inscribed a square, we inscribed a regular hexagon, a regular six-sided figure, and a regular triangle, which is just known as an equilateral triangle, all right? There's really very few of these types of regular polygons that you can inscribe in a circle using simply a straight edge and a compass. There is one additional one on the homework you can do, but I'm going to leave that for the homework because I don't want to spoil it right now. But for example, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to inscribe a five-sided figure known as a pentagon in a circle, right? It's hard to inscribe a regular pentagon in a circle. I can inscribe all sorts of pentagons and circles by simply plotting five points somewhere around the circle and connecting them, all right? But inscribing a regular pentagon is impossible with only a compass and a straight edge. All right, so make sure to commit these types of constructions to memory. They're very, very easy, but at the same time, they do tend to show up quite a bit on state exams and things like that. So you wanna be able to do them to get your two points on that particular construction problem. All right, for now, I just wanna thank you for joining me for another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.